Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you've saved us. We thank you that for every person who chose to, Lord, to chose to put their faith in your saving message that our sins have been forgiven, when you took the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future, on the cross, and then when we put our faith in you, we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Lord, you're not walking around with any one of us who are born again. You don't have a yellow legal pad like some bosses we work for, jotting down every little mistake we made so we'll have a meeting at the end of the day and go home with an ulcer. You're not like that, Lord. We're under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, every one of us is worthy to have, to, to, to not only know about God, but to walk with God personally. And we're saved eternally. No one can steal us of our salvation. Um, we're saved eternally, God. So we praise you for that. So in the middle of the dark world, Lord, the light of the gospel is burning brightly from our hearts. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the darkness has never overcome the light. So we say over the internet, over social media, over this meeting in North Dakota, we say out loud that the darkness and the powers of darkness and the witches and the witchcraft and the Satanists and the occult secret societies hear a testimony from the word of the Lord. You will never, you never have and you never will overcome the armies of heaven, the peaceful armies of heaven, and the peaceful armies of light. You will never overcome them. And in fact, in Genesis, excuse me, in the book of Revelation, uh, it says that Jesus Christ is returning to the earth, King of kings and Lord of lords, and along with Jesus, who's riding a white horse where it says faithful and true, the armies of heaven are descending with him. And they're going to land at the Battle of Armageddon, the world's great final battle in the Valley of Megiddo near, uh, in Jerusalem, near, excuse me, in Israel, near Jerusalem. And the armies of heaven and Jesus Christ are going to defeat Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all those who accepted the mark of the beast, and all the fallen angels, they will be defeated at Armageddon, along with all the nations of the earth, who in their spiritual delusion decided to mobilize their most advanced military technology, including genetic super soldiers and everything else, and they will be defeated at Armageddon by the only true King of Kings and Lord of Lords because the temporary God of this world is Lucifer and the temporary Luciferian system is called the world system or the Luciferian world system, also known as Mystery Babylon. And what does it say in the book of Revelation? And we'll read it. But it says, uh, fall, uh, Mystery Babylon, the great harlot, fallen, fallen. So there's a prophetic warning from the Lord that Mystery Babylon, the great harlot at the end of the days, which is the satanic Luciferian world system, is going to fall under the judgment of God because right now we need to see ourselves as the... How many know that we need to see ourselves as the Word sees us, as God sees us, not how religion sees us, not how the Christian religion sees us? Definitely not... We, we're not to see us, ourselves as the secular news media the fake news media, and by the way, fake is really a synonym for like a lie. So instead of calling them the fake news media, we need to call them the lying news media. And Satan is the father of lies. And why are they the lying news media? Because they lie about everything, and distorting the truth is just a form of the lies. And how do they portray us as believers in Christ? We are the body of Jesus Christ. We're the supernatural body of Christ on the earth of which Jesus is the head and all true born-again believers are the body of Christ on the earth 
And it says in Ephesians that as the body of Christ, and every one of us who are born again are part of that body, we have the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions with our feet. That means Jesus Christ has supernaturally reinstated the supernatural authority that he gave to Adam and Eve when they functioned as kings and queens of the Garden of Eden or paradise. And when they were in paradise before they activated the law of sin and death, they had the supernatural authority to rule and reign over the Garden of Eden or to have dominion, which means to, to reign over the Garden of Eden, paradise. So they ruled. Uh, Lucifer, in the form of the erect reptilian being, the, the serpent of old, he was held in check. Now, our real space-time genetic ancestors, Adam and Eve, and we're all related to Adam and Eve, no matter what color you are, what race, what ethnic group, when we go way, 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 way back, our great, 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 great grandmother and our great, 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 great grandfather, we all have the same uh, great grandfather and great grandmother, Adam and Eve. So we all came from the same genetic pool, okay? Unless you're a Nephilim. And if you're a Nephilim, I doubt very much that you're still here because after listening to the preaching since the beginning of the conference, I don't think any Nephilim could take that much of the Word of God. They, they, they've already bolted for the door. So assuming that there's no Nephilim in here, um, you, you are the supernatural body of Christ. And one of the things that God did, how did Satan become the temporary God of this world? When we talk about ancient Babylon in Genesis, the world's first one world government, one world religion, one world economic system, how did Satan become, how, think about this, how did Satan Adam and Eve had everything. Number one, let's talk about the features of their relationship in, in um, acceptable terms. There's an expression in the world, you, you, you hear it a lot um, uh, uh, on these talk shows, and I'm not a big fan of these talk shows, I channel surf, okay? And I always hear these women or men talking about, they want a soulmate. And it's not, they don't mean it in an occult sense so much. They, what they're saying is they want a life partner that they can relate to on every level. That they'll be their best friend, that would like, that they'll share life together, they'll grow old together. It's really a kind of a very Christian concept, okay? So they call it a soulmate. They want to spend their lives, you know, not just have physical intimacy and then, you know, disappear in a one night stand. They would like somebody to, to journey through life together. And here, where it gets a little mystical, they, they kind of believe that the universe, or whatever they call God, has a soul made for them. Now, that's a counterfeit of the Christian truth, which is this. If you seek the face of the Lord regarding a uh, prospective uh, mate, a husband or wife, I believe God has a woman or a man chosen for you. Now, before you panic, have an ulcer and get in a fight with your spouse driving to lunch or on the way home, and somebody gets mad because somebody does something stupid like hitting the brakes or something too hard, and somebody goes, well, you certainly weren't my soulmate. I, I, I just settled for you. But guess what? God is so powerful. God is so wonderful that... You think in your finite mind you married the wrong person? See, in your logical human mind, if you're in strife or temptation, temptation to have a divorce, you think that, oh, you missed the right person, and that's why you ended up with this, whatever you're going to call your husband when you don't like him secretly, and whatever you're going to call your wife secretly when, when, when you're mad at her. Can we all be honest enough to, to say that that goes through our heads? So I'm the only one. All right. I'm the only one. You liars. You need to repent right here on the altar. You've all had those thoughts. We're human beings, right? I've been married for uh, 43 years, 44 years. And, and you know what? And you, people always go, what does this have to do with Bible prophecy? Everything, you, you airhead. Read what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, the mystery of Christ and the church. The fact that Christ is the bridegroom 
returning in the last days to get us the supernatural bride or body of Christ. And that doesn't mean uh, men are supposed to be feminized so that they can be in the, in the body or bride of Christ. You got that, men? God created us to be men. That doesn't mean we necessarily have to be John Wayne, okay? Or there's not too many role models of, of, of a man's man anymore, is there? Come on, men. It's the, the, the new thing they've been programming through social engineering and brainwashing in the media uh, and, and TV and episodics, now the new man is feminized. He kind of acts like his wife. And, and notice how the media is a mind control machine, an Orwellian mind control machine. So men, notice how that every sitcom, every um, uh, TV show, talk show or whatever, notice that the father figure, if there even is a father figure left in any of these sitcoms, he's the, the bozo, he's the buffoon, and it's the strong wife who pulls the family together. She's the leader, and the man just sits in front of the TV, drinks beer and, and belches and God knows what else, and he's useless. That's, you see, a key to brainwashing is repetition. So they've made, they, there's a war on malehood, okay? Now, and it's malehood of every race and every ethnic group, but this isn't reverse racism. But we all know the number one target for the attack on malehood, they call it the angry white male. That us of a, those of us that are white, this is not a racist statement, because I believe, I believe unlike the evolutionists, who basically, if you read the theory of evolution carefully, it implies that some races are superior and some races are inferior. That's the Darwinian theory. The fittest survive, okay? So the implication within Darwinian theory of evolution is that there has to be an inferior race and a master race. And the master race is usually portrayed as white, blonde-haired, brown-haired, whatever, uh, uh, men and women, okay? According to evolutionary theory. That's why Hitler, as uh, uh, Pastor Mike was saying yesterday, went with that Nordic, that Nordic look, okay? That's embedded all over the theory of evolution. That's why Margaret Sanger, the founder of Pan, Pan, Planned Parenthood, was financed by that wonderful super trillionaire, Rockefeller. He financed those early uh, abortion clinics. I think they started in the 20s and way before the 1920s. And guess where she placed all the abortion clinics? She placed all the abortion clinics in African American neighborhoods and then some Hispanic neighborhoods because the idea was to wipe out, that's their words, not mine, the undesirable races. Do you see how Evolution, look, here's, here's how it really works. The globalist elite lie publicly. They pretend to be compassionate. They pretend to com care about the earth and in the environment. They, they, they pretend to be great soldiers of social justice and wealth distribution, cleaning up nature and pure, clean water. It's a big, phony act. They, they pretend to be very concerned about uh, we don't want to have disease epidemics, so we're going to vaccinate everybody under the sun. The big, big phony act. When in reality, all of their motives among the highest ranking globalist elite, and remember, information is compartmentalized, so you have a lot of people like Al Gore, who's a, he wants to be at the top of the pyramid, but they don't quite trust him. I don't think he's got the IQ points to be up there. So they keep him lower on the uh, pyramid hierarchy scale. And he, he, he's a function, but he's what Stalin and Lenin used to call, communist revolutionaries would call, a useful idiot. Because he's really not too bright. Have you ever hear him talk on television? He's really not that bright. He's kind of a dumbo, okay? And his, theory, uh, his theories are crackpot theories. So, so he's a lower level, okay? The higher level are very smart. So, but he's a pawn, and the thing is that the globalist elite pretend to be loving and compassionate and concerned about social justice. Oh, let's open the borders 
because that's what Christ would do. Is that really what Christ would do? First of all, you know nothing about Christ. You've outlawed Christ from the school systems. You've outlawed, out, uh, outlawed Christ from the media, which you own. The globalists elite own the media through four corporations, globalist corporations. You've outlawed Christ from government, the public school system. You don't allow the teaching of the Bible, or you don't even have a Bible in your own households and castles. You don't allow your children to read the Bible. So what do you know about Christ? You know nothing about Christ. And they stereotype you and me. Ever notice how you have the weak males, okay? It's an attack on masculinity because their goal is to destroy the family structure. The key to destroying the family structure is bring down a strong masculine male. And they reframe the consciousness to get all the women uh, on board because, you see, when you reframe the perception of the male, a strong male falsely is perceived as an abuser. He's an emotionally abusive. He's sexually abusive to his wife, perhaps to his daughter, or God knows what. He's, he's selfish. He's ruthless. His strength is always cruelty. So they paint a distorted, and there are men like that, but they're the minority, okay? Um, and they paint a very ugly picture of a strong male, especially a strong white male. And then they raise up the woman artificially because they want to topple God's order, where the man is the head of the household spiritually, but because they're the world, they have no clue what God's template or design is for the man being the head of the household spiritually, because you certainly can't strut around in your home like some kind of dictator firing orders to your wife if you're going through the biblical template, because in order to be the spiritual head of your house, you also have to be like Christ was to the church, and here's your constraints. You have to be willing to die for or give up your life for your wife. So you're not going to be doing a whole lot of strutting around, okay? Because your, your authority comes from your servanthood to your wife. You're to love your wife as Christ loved the church. So yes, God wants you to be a strong male, a powerful man of God a powerful man of God, okay? But you're to be a powerful man of God and a powerful leader of God. You have the anointing and the supernatural authority to be the spiritual head of the household, but the, 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 the accountability factor is you have to behave towards your wife like Christ behaved towards the church, and Christ ultimately gave up his life for the church and died for the church. So that has to be the, in, the, the interior motive of a man's heart. Now, if you're functioning in that mode, a servant king, a servant king. A lot of evangelical churches, they have the servant part right, and I call it the doormat part. So they teach the theology of a man should be a doormat and, and a servant. That is not what the Bible teaches. And you know why they did that? I had to figure this out. I was a slow learner on this. You've got to understand, when I first got married to my darling wife, Christina, we've been married for like 44 years now, our honeymoon could be called Vietnam. Uh, we rented a suite in a particular state, you know, where they had a big bathtub and... Uh, um, nothing weird, just a, just, just a honeymoon suite. And, um, and um, I forgot what I was going to say, it was important. <laughs> but I learned from the first day of, my, oh, I know what I learned. I had advice from a bad pastor. He, he's a great man of God, don't get me wrong. You, couldn't, you, you, know, you can get bad advice from a great man of God, because we're all flawed. So a guy can have the truth down really tight, 90%, and miss it 10%. So he, we were having marriage problems in the early part of our marriage. And because I came from a broken home, she came from a broken home. My role model was my father who was an artist and intellectual, and he would paint pictures of nudes on motorcycles. 
Alice in Wonderland, and then uh, very tender nature scenes, but with the nudes on motorcycles. To show you how wild my father was, he was seven times. I led him to the Lord, by the way. He became born again, totally changed, a fabulous man of God. But think about it. We had, the, we had a very large apartment in Jackson Heights, Queens, not because we were super wealthy, but the neighborhood we lived in, these apartment buildings were built for the elite. But the elite no longer lived in this neighborhood, but the middle class could afford to buy these apartment buildings that had like, uh, your apartment had like four bathrooms and it was huge. So even though you weren't rich, you could really enjoy something that you normally couldn't afford. And then on the top of the apartment building, there were studio apartments. And my father was renting a studio. This is when I was like nine years old. And he would hire nude models to paint, just of course for their artistic whatever. And it was a scandal of the neighborhood. Half the men thought, wow, I'd like to be like Paul McGuire's father, you know. And then my mother was ready to kill him. But that, back then, in the 50s and 60s, that was pretty odd. That was a pretty outrageous lifestyle. So I grew up with a lot of artists, intellectuals. My best friend became the head. What is that noise? OK. My best friend became the head. I can't name his name. No, I will name his name. Um, um, Jamie Dimon, the head of uh, Goldman Sachs, was my best friend growing up. So we had a real eclectic mixture of people. Well, what I learned was, that was not the masculine role, you know, messing around with women. The ma masculine role was faithfulness laying, and laying down your life for your wife like Christ did for the church. So this pastor told me, Paul, your problem is this. You need to get out the Bible. This is, we were married a week. And we're, my uh, initial weeks and months of marriage I describe as Vietnam. And that's a literal description of the level of fights we had in our household when I was newly married. And it was really tragic to me because I prayed and fasted that I'd have the right woman. We, we, we did not cross the line physically, you know. I, uh, and, and then we had World War, uh, not World War, Vietnam. And he said to me, Paul, your problem, he had a deep voice. A great man of God, he really helped me in a lot of ways except this way. And he said, you need to take out the book of Ephesians where the apostle... Paul talks about women must submit to their husbands uh, like the church does to Christ, okay? But he left out all the others. So he said, Paul, you need to grab the bull by the horns and show her who's boss, okay? Now, I don't know. I'm not, I came from a messed up family. I don't know. So I figured this is what I got to do. My pastor's telling me. So I get home. I had a much bigger King James Bible. I slam it down on the kitchen table first thing in the morning. Darling, we need to have a Bible study. And I read Ephesians. My voice is deeper, kind of like John Wayne. I'm in touch with my testosterone. And I say, OK, I'm going to man up, baby. And I am going to lay the law down to this wild. It's not, not what, is it a female bull called? I know nothing about farming. What's a female bull? What do you call it? What do you call it? I don't have a clue. All I know is I'm supposed to grab this bull by the horns. She's a beautiful woman. But, but my pastor said, grab the bull by the horns and show her who's boss. Get it set straight. Get that pattern set straight. Or you're going to have a life of hell. So I break open Ephesians 6. Totally ignore the fact that I'm supposed to love her like Christ, like the church. Totally ignore the verses I'm supposed to pick up my cross and serve her, like die for her like Christ did to the church. I, to I only read what the pastor told me, which is, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. So I have a deep voice. I slam the Bible. I'm reading it in King James to get more authority. And I say, let's read this out loud, okay? And make sure she had a... Bible verse. Let's read this out loud together. Now, I thought this was going to be the key to the healing of my marriage. So, I'm serious. That's how stupid I was. Okay? That's when you see the cynicalness about Christian leadership and stuff. It comes from a lifetime of experience. Okay, so, I'm reading the word to her. I'm making her, her read the word out loud. She really is a lovely woman. The problem is, 
we both came from broken homes, so we didn't we didn't have a like a, like a a, a a blueprint on like how marriage works in in the proper way. So anyway, I make her read the part that wives submit to your. Oh, and I loved it. I relished in those words to make her hear her say it. Wives, you know, coming right out of her mouth. Come on, guys, you know what that's like. You know that feeling. Come on, you're getting the ultimate respect you always deserved. I know you got to act nice because your wife's sitting next to you. But we know the truth, guys. We know the truth. We're men, right? Yes? Or at least some of us are. I don't know what the rest of you are. Okay, so wives submit to your husband as Christ did to the church. <clears throat> and when she reads that, I'm expecting the Spirit of God to convict her. She's going to be crying in repentance. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I've, I've not been submissive. I haven't honored you as the, uh, as the head of that spiritual head of the household. Guess what happens? She reads it. It's like hitting the ignition button on a nuke. She explodes, throws the Bible down, and just lets me have it of saying, you know, what about you picking up the cross? And then she leaves me and goes back to Salt Lake City. She's not a Mormon. Anyway, God miraculously heals our marriage. And I find out over time that, guess what? I read the verse out of context. And I forgot all the qualifiers, like I'm supposed to pick up my cross and lay down my life for my wife. And then you, you discover, if you're laying down your life for your wife, like Christ did to the church, a woman has a much stronger inclination to respect you and to follow your leadership. Yes, women? Say something, women. <laughs> or I feel like I'm talking to that, well, who's the spy who had the transgender operation? Come on, help me out, women. I'm saying this on your behalf. Okay, I'll sink. Okay. So the other thing I learned was this. In Bible prophecy, because that's what you want to know. In Bible prophecy, if we fail to miss the words of the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ and the constant and continual references, beginning in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve, with Christ and the church, the fact that the bridegroom is coming, Jesus Christ, to take his bride, that's all true believers, male and female, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? And by the way, this great man of God, who was my mentor, he just had, was messed up in this area, he founded a ministry which I was part of, which was just called the Lamb's Supper Club. It was a Broadway theater in Times Square in New York, and it was called the Lamb's Supper Club, and we would serve, sometimes we would charge tickets as I promoted Christian concerts, and thousands and thousands of people would come to the Lord, but sometimes we would feed the homeless four course elegant dinners, the best Christian music bands, and people would volunteer as waiters and waitresses and, and serve these homeless people like they were in an expensive restaurant because food places donated food to us. And they would be sobbing in tears that nobody ever treated them with dignity before. And many thousands of people came to the Lord. So you cannot understand Bible prophecy unless you understand that, yes, God is going to pour out his judgment in tribulation. He's going to pour out his wrath. There's going to be an interval in the seven-year tribulation period. The first three and a half years is called the tribulation period, the midpoint where the Antichrist sets him up, himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem and demands to be worshipped as God, is prophesied as the abomination of desolation. It's prophesied in Daniel 9. It's prophesied by Jesus Christ. It's prophesied by the Apostle Paul. There's this continual prophecy about the abomination of desolation. And that is when the Antichrist sets himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem, which Trump is trying to build, from what I hear, very quickly behind the scenes. He's racing. Trump is racing to build the temple in Jerusalem. So if Trump builds the temple in Jerusalem, that will be another super, super prophetic sign. Because 
once the temple is rebuilt, the Jews, because the Jewish religion is centered on temple worship. Unlike Christian religion, we can meet in Bible studies, we can meet in churches, but authentic Judaism has to be practiced in conjunction with only one temple, the temple in Jerusalem where they have animal sacrifices. Not that they believe that animal sacrifices uh, do away with sin, but they believe that it's a memorial service which points the way to the Messiah of Israel doing away with their sin. So when that temple is built, and that temple, the Bible, uh, in my opinion, people disagree, okay, that the Bible clearly references the fact that the temple must be rebuilt in Jerusalem. The Antichrist, three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation, sets himself up in the rebuilt temple, and he demands that the entire world worships him as God. And that causes God three and a half years into the tribulation, to release what's called the great tribulation or the great wrath of God, where God's like ultimate wrath is poured out. And when you see the intensity of the judgments that come upon the earth after the abomination of desolation sets himself up in the rebuilt temple, it's like that's when when it's absolutely terrifying to see what happens to the earth. Okay? And then... The Jews are hiding in the rock fortress of Petra. And see, everybody's all upset about the Jews. Well, they're so carnal. Of course they're carnal. What were you before you got saved? Were you a sinner or a saint in your behavior and your thought life? You don't have to raise your hands. I I, I know for a fact, because guess what? I have a fallen nature. I was born with a fallen nature. You were born with a fallen nature. Every man and woman alive was born with a fallen nature. We as Christians, and and especially humanists, okay, they're worse than we as Christians, they like to gloss over their fallen human nature. But let me just give you an insight into your fallen human nature in a very quick manner. There is no sin under the sun. There is no abomination There is no lewdness, there is no perversion, there is no horror, there is no evil done by anybody under the sun, including people like Adolf Hitler and others, that you and I are not totally capable of if we were ever to look deep inside the dark pools of our fallen human nature. You see, I'm not a Calvinist uh, in the sense of being uh, embracing all of Calvinist theology, but they have a number of things right. And one of the things they have right is they say that our nature, our sinful human nature, is utterly depraved. It's, uh, we are utterly depraved in our fallen nature. Anything good that comes from us comes from the fact that Christ lives in us and we're born again. You you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so God sets up this teaching of marriage, the bridegroom. God sends his bridegroom, Jesus Christ, to rescue his true church, the supernatural body of Christ. That means wherever you are on planet Earth, If you are truly born again by the Spirit of God, if you have truly repented of your sins, you're born again, and you're guaranteed entrance into heaven, you are a true member of the supernatural body of Christ or the bride of Christ on earth. So when Christ returns, he's going to take you, not because you're perfect, but because of his grace and because of his blood, he's going to take you you personally with him before the outbreak of this outpouring of God's wrath. You're going to be taken into heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is going to be the greatest cosmic party in the history of the galaxy and planet Earth. And you will be with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you one thing about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is not going to be some boring Kiwanis Club, I'm not knocking the Kiwanis Club, school cafeteria, and I know a lot of people across the country now like to, 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 to have lunch in hospital cafeterias because I guess the food is tasting better. 
but there's no way this boy is going to eat in a hospital cafeteria because I'm saying to myself, um, death's all around me, man. Why do I want to eat in, in, in this delicious cafeteria? But, but it's not going to be a hospital cafeteria. It's not going to be. This food is going to be so great. It's going to be such a party. You're going to laugh your head off. You're going to rejoice. You're going to be liberated. The real you is you're going to be accepted by everybody. Nobody's going to walk around. I'd like to walk around there, but I'll probably be out of camera and snarl at you and give you these suspicious, judgmental rejection looks. How many, how many know that being in the body of Christ on earth can be very troublesome? Because many of our brothers and sisters, including ourselves, are very carnal. They're not really controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the major way you can measure that is they demonstrate a lack of tr true agape love, the love of Jesus Christ. And how that manifests is, how many have been in, in a group of Christians where you get a little dirty look? about what you're wearing, what you said, or whatever, okay? How many has that happened to besides me? Okay, good. Okay. I, as a public minister and a public figure who, who enjoys, I, I think I enjoy it like my other uh, brothers who are teaching here because they, they say some pretty wild things, but it's biblical. I mean, I've parked in the parking lot of, of, of one of the major churches in the United States, a great man of God, you'd know his name, Oh, I'll name his name, uh, Jack Hayford. Many of you know him. He mentored me spiritually for 25 years. It was part of his ministry. But I park in the parking lot of the church he founded in a special parking place by the permission of the head guard man of the parking lot who took a lot of my classes in prophecy. And another guy pulls up and starts cursing at me in front of my three kids. At that time, I kind of looked like Chevy Chase and our, you know, Christmas vacation time, you know. I'm really harmless. And, and he's screaming at me, and I have this sense, why does he hate me? He seems to know all about me. And being that I'm a radio talk show host with a massive presence at that time in L.A. and many places, chances are he was listening to me. But he didn't tip, tip me off on that. But then the next thing I know, he's screaming at me as I'm walking with my wife and three kids into the church building. At the top of his lungs, he's screaming at me. Paul McGuire, so he didn't even know my name, he pretended. Paul McGuire, you're demon possessed! <clears throat> you know, it's like a scene from The Exorcist. Demon possessed, man. I'm trying to help my wife get out of the car to go to church, my three young kids going to church. He's screaming at me at the top of his lungs, you're demon possessed! And I, and I said to him, I thought you said you didn't know my name, and I'm a complete stranger, because now he knows my whole biography. And so that's the kind of thing. You say, oh, that happened to you once? No, let me tell you something. That kind of weird scenario happens to me all the time. And, and, and all I know, I do make some strong statements from up here. But generally speaking, I try to, I've worked in the business world. I try to hone in on my people skills, be polite. You know, you know what I'm saying? Just like you do. You know, I don't walk around obnoxious or big ego. I try to really exercise my people skills. And I try to be humble in the sense that, if you're a Christian leader, don't start around and be arrogant. I just try to be real and humble and not put on airs, okay? But I still get these attacks. Now, so here's the key thing here. We're part of the supernatural body of Christ. God's going to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. And that wrath comes in the second half of the three and a half year tribulation period, okay? The other thing to understand is when we go to Mystery Babylon, and this is where it gets so heavy, so heavy. In fact, you're going to need supplemental reading, and I'm not just saying it to, to sell a book. And I know Carl said that something similar. And this is not like a, a salesman's trick. It's just that what I've learned in my life, I'm the author of 34 books. I have read books my entire life. And I have never met an individual who is a powerful, independent thinker. I've never met a smart person who has not developed the ability of, number one, thinking for themselves and not just going along with groupthink. And I've never met an intelligent, smart individual who has not developed the habit of 
self-educating themselves, either by reading books or watching certain videos or listening to selective, selective Bible teachers you can trust, like uh, Pastor Hoggard and Carl Teichrib, you know, guys who really know what they're talking about, but more importantly, they have integrity in their research and they have integrity in their lives. I have never met people who God could use unless they were willing to rigorously self-educate themselves by exposing themselves to teachings, reading books especially. There's a whole science of neuropsychology of how your brain becomes more intelligent through reading, especially the Word of God. And if, if you're reading what the re world uh, reads, I'm not trying to knock Dr. Oz. He says a few good things. But if you're just saturating uh, Dr. Oz, Oprah for Win for, for Winfrey, Brzezinski's daughter, who, who I sometimes wonder has gone through an MKUltra program. I, I just said wonder. I, I didn't say she did. Or, uh, you know, the, the, the MKUltra clown show of talk show hosts that appear on uh, cable net news networks and all the, you know. If that's where you're getting your information pool, you're going to be dumbed down and you're going to have no clue, like most of your friends, right? And you know what I mean by most of your friends, because if you were to talk to most of your friends about everything we've talked about in this conference, which happens to be biblically true and based on the Bible, chances are that most of them would look at you like terrified, like, 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 you know, the deer caught in the headlights, that glazed over look. How many know what I'm talking about? They're like, you know, and they can be very intelligent people. There's no, there's no separation uh, between those people being very intelligent and having big IQs and big vocabularies, but when it comes to perception and seeing reality and bias against the Bible, they can be in moron land, right? But notice something about them. They are indignant. They have a cult-like fanaticism. I know, half my family's like this. I got some brilliant people in my family. Half the people in the family I saved. I should say I saved. The Lord used me to, to, to lead them to Christ. And the other half, I mean, we're talking about warmongering, uh, revolutionary humanists to the bitter end. Smart people, I can't, I can't tell you their profession, smart people who were in high places, and I'm talking to uh, my lovely sister, I mean, which is we're friends from way back since we were little kids, and I forgot that all of their kids used to watch me on the History Channel on a regular basis, speaking about Bible prophecy, because the History Channel did two specials on me, and I forgot what I say, because when you say a lot of stuff, you can't remember what you said. But I guess I said, and I make a habit not to say this, but I guess I made some remark about 911, and I subtly questioned the engineering possibility and reality of two jumbo jets flying into planes and the planes, uh, the, the buildings collapse in like a pancake manner with explosives lit up in the building. And uh, then, of course, uh, the Building 7 uh, just falls to the ground, and it had dynamite in it. And then, look, I'm not a moron, and you're not morons, okay? We, we, we can fellowship over this. Here, we should all do a warm hug, okay? <laughs> kind of like the hippies used to do. We should gather around in a circle and hug each other, because we, we, we share, as part of the body of Christ, the faithful remnant, we share, we share something in common. We love the truth and we use the God-given mind of Christ that God gave us. And so when we see the Pentagon with a hole that's this big, I'm exaggerating, and yet this massive commercial airliner filled with passengers crashes through the Pentagon and the hole's this big, and I'm not an engineer, but the, 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 the wind span of the plane and the engine of the plane is like that big, one would think that the hole in the Pentagon would be like like that, like that. And then one would think that the debris inside the Pentagon would at least, at least, at least have an engine in it that's not made for a one-seater, uh, smallest plane ever made to mankind. 
you would think there would be multiple jet, massive jet engines in there. Wouldn't you think that? I mean, right? If it actually crashed through the wall of the Pentagon. So there's something wrong with the size of the, the hole in the wall and the alleged size of the jet that went through it. And then the other jet, which jet number was this? I forget. That fell in the, uh, uh, in the earth there. What was it? What? Yeah, what, no, what was the number of that jet? Say it again. 90, oh, yeah, 93. 93. Okay, 93. We've all seen the pictures right after it went down. There's no jet wreckage. There's some minor something, like somebody went to the auto supply shop and dumped out a bunch of uh, 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 parts from an old Volkswagen made in 1963. There's no, that, well, where's the engine? Where's the body debris? Where's, where's anything? It's not there. And then again, I'm not you know, a telecommunications expert, but as I understand it, the altitude that they were flying at, it was impossible to use cell phones. Cell phones did not work at that altitude. 30,000 feet? Okay. So are they above 30,000 feet? What? But, but we've all seen these documentaries where they're having these extensive phone calls with federal workers in offices. And, and so, so, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no electronic physical way that they could have been talking to these people in the federal government because their, their cell phones, correct me if I'm wrong, don't work at that altitude, right? So what's that all about? What is that all about? And now, to give you a little illustration about how mind control and propaganda works, repetition is a key, <clears throat> but there are certain actors, many actors I personally believe and I deal with, no, this is one of the things purposed in my heart to tell you. Since 1947 and the advent of MKUltra mind control programming, and the raising up of artificial personalities, I believe, you may think I'm a nut, but I prove it in my books, like uh, Conquering the Matrix, I prove it in. I prove it in um, A Prophecy of the Future of America. I prove it in A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016 to 2017, which should have been retitled 2016 to 2030. But I prove it, and then I prove it in the book Mass Awakening where I talk about mass mind control, individual mind control, how to determine whether or not you're under programming, the techniques of mind control, and then we have a brand new video documentary, very inexpensive, called American Mind Wars, The Coming Crisis Event. And we, I made an arrangement with my webmaster to discount the four book bundle on the books <clears throat> and the vi <clears throat> video documentary <clears throat> to significantly discount for anybody watching the con uh, con concert conference or anybody at the conference because, because I had to take a red eye from LA to beat the storm. I was un unable to bring my books. So I feel bad you asking for books. I don't have them at the book table. But if you go to paulmaguire.us, paulmaguire.us, I have special discounts on all these books for you, okay? The people who are attending or watching via the internet. Where I get into documentation, like Carl has excellent documentation, but he certainly can't share it all verbally. So I'm documenting everything I'm saying. So the thing is, that's an example of mind control. Now, the way this works is there are certain actors, I call them Johnny on the spot disinformation agents. If you look at their career, they're the stars of every disinformation movie. Tom Hanks. What was the movie he made where he's helping this little boy find a, the key to a P.O. A PO box or something there where his father left a, a message and it took place in the neighborhood where 911 happened? What was the name of that movie? It was a big hit movie. But notice how this works. In this movie, Tom Hanks is helping this little boy find a P.O. box where his father, who died in the 9-11 incident, 
uh, hid some kind of you know, jewels or a note of love to his son. They don't know. So they're, they're trying to find it all over Manhattan in the neighborhood where 911 and the Trade Towers and Building 7 went down. And people are, you know, you can see the, the, the wreckage of the buildings and the whole thing. But, but they're ignoring the big picture, which is 911 and all the inconsistencies of the buildings coming down, to focus in on this stupid story of looking for this little uh, safety box that has some memorabilia in it. What's the purpose of that in terms of mind control? It's called diversion. Get the audience hooked up into a hum highly emotional bonding story with Tom Hanks and this little boy and, get, and, and, and let them ignore the buildings, the incineration, and all the rest, and let them focus in on this tiny, obscure, and we don't even know if the story's true. Okay, So what that does to America is they see that and they now start to forget about the big picture of 911 and they focus in on this microscopic story of a lost key in a P.O. box. You look at Tom Hanks' career and you see movie after movie where he functions one way or another as an agent of disinformation or diversion. He played the captain in that movie about the pirates that captured that ship. You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> but his role was fictionalized, because there's documentaries out that say that the Tom Hanks movie is not the way it happened at all. And which Apollo, what was it, Apollo what, that Tom Hanks was in? Was it 13? OK. Now, again, disinformation, because Tom Hanks is there in Apollo 13, and they're crashing through the Earth's atmosphere, and they, and, and, and they have the Teflon shield and that little space cone, and it goes down, but they're ignoring all these scientific facts. The metallic structure of that spacecraft was so poorly made that as they pass through the upper atmosphere into the atmosphere, from what I understand by respectable scientists, that little uh, Apollo 13 thing should have vaporized and burned up. And so Hanks is used as a vehicle to keep you diverted from the essential truth. That's how propaganda and mind control works. Now, this is going to be hard because I know I'm under the gun, but so what? The bride of Christ is every believer who has received Christ into their life and are truly born again, we automatically become supernatural members of the invisible supernatural body of Christ on earth. And that is the true church. Anybody that says they're a Christian, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or Presbyterian or whatever you want to call yourselves, if the leadership in that church and the people in that church are not truly born again, and if they've not truly become new creatures in Christ Jesus, if they have not received forgiveness of their sins by faith, and if they've not received salvation by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, if they've not invited Christ into their life to be born again, then they're not born again, and the seeker-friendly churches, which are in apostasy, are depriving them of really understanding the central purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is impossible. And by the way, if you're sitting here watching us on the internet, which is rigged, by the way, I make a living studying how to research and specifically studying and understanding the hidden dynamics that makes search engines work and social media work in the internet. And when I see numbers um, in Christian events where real Christian truth is being spoken, inevitably, I will always see rigged numbers. They rig the numbers of views and watchers with the strategic intent of marginalizing the group, marginalizing the speakers, so that they can stop the truth of the message from spreading virally. 
And they do it with computer algorithms, they do it with computer bots, but just like communist China, they have endless rooms of these sizes where people are sitting at desks with those little cubicles and a laptop, and they actually have human beings making decisions on, on who they're going to censor or not. Now you say, Paul, how do you know that for a fact? Because I was on the internet in the beginning, I see the way it works, and I'm able to detect, usually within minutes, whether the individual or group is really of the Lord, or they're a counterfeit, or they're disinformation, or they're not saved at all, okay? Because I have discernment and I have a brain, and I've trained my brain's perceptive abilities, logic, reason, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the gift of discernment. I will see counterfeit Christian prophecy, conservative websites, YouTubes, etc. They're counterfeit. I know they're counterfeit. I look in the eyes, and everything in me knows that that guy I'm looking at is not born again. There's also logical clues. They don't have a biography that goes back more than three years. My biography as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the same with Carl and Mike, goes back decades and decades and decades and decades on the internet. I'm not Johnny who came out from nowhere. But you have an entire army of people that have been raised up with big money who are counterfeit prophecy, counterfeit conservative political commentators. And I'm looking at this guy, and I know that he's not saved. You say, that's pretty presumptuous. But then I use my logic and reason. He has on his YouTubes a minimum of 174,000 views. And I see a whole list of people that have 174, 274,000, 374,000 views. And then ever start, it started all with the Trump election cycle. They, they rigged the internet. And so what I've learned is that if you're a plant and you're not speaking the truth, your views, your watchers and readers can be in the hundreds of thousands. And then I check all the ministries and organizations. I know these guys personally. They've, they've been around for 40 years. They tell the real truth. And I'm looking at their numbers, and they're infinitesimal. They're small. Yet I know in reality they have massive audiences. So how come all the real deal, truthful Christian communicators have smaller numbers, they're censored from the search engines, and all these Johnny-come-latelys have hundreds of thousands of viewers. You think that's by accident? No, you have to understand that the deep state, and you can take it from there, is rigging the internet because one of the key facets of mind control, propaganda, social engineering, persuasion, advertising, brainwashing, hypnotic programming, one of the key facets of that is they did a study where they, uh, Walter Lippmann, a journalist in the 1920s, came up with this study for Woodrow Wilson. Edward Bernays in 1936, the father of modern propaganda, came up with a similar study in 1936. So 1920s, 1936, two pivotal research studies on propaganda. And among many things that they discovered, was this principle. The average man or woman, no matter how intelligent you are, will change their belief system radically. They'll denounce old beliefs, they'll embrace new beliefs, not based on whether or not one set of beliefs is true or false based on facts. The deciding factor upon which 99% of the population will make their belief systems is this. Are the people that they perceive to be the in people, the authority figures, the movie celebrities, the cultural heroes, the presidents, the status symbol economists, the best-selling authors, all the people who are considered like the who's who of society, whatever those people believe collectively, like, like, like a baby totally born out of the womb is not a baby. If, if the elite in society believe that, the average man 
or a woman will not make their uh, evaluation based on objective, scientific, logical thought, logical reasoning, uh, critical thinking. They will make, just like a high school kid, they will make their decision upon what to believe publicly, what to stand for publicly, based on will this put them in the in-group so that they can get this inherited respect and be viewed upon as somebody who's with it and relevant and part of society. Do you see how that works? It's like what you've got to understand is you've got to look behind the illusion. All these people, not true remnant church Christians, but all these people will, will believe in lies. Uh, they'll believe in socialism. They'll believe in communism. They'll believe in anything if that's what the other people they admire believe, the elite. Whether or not that individual thinks it's scientifically true or there's facts to establish it doesn't, doesn't, is not part of their decision-making process. This is pretty scary because it's so simple. What, why they make their decision is whatever the in-group of any given society, what they believe the average person is going to believe, and they will willfully surrender their logic and reason and adapt the craziest beliefs as long as they're part of the in-group. Now, we all understand this principle because we were all in high school at one time, right? How many of us knew in most high schools there was the in-group, the kind of in-group, and then the out-group, right? The price tag to be in the in-group, you had to have a certain haircut, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, right? Same, same phenomenal. You see how that works, mind control? Very subtle way. So, now, the supernatural body of Christ, and here's the key thing when it comes to Mystery Babylon, and I'm going to develop this further, by the way, because it's so critical. And the critical thing, and I've mentioned this before at this conference a number of times, but there's two appearances of Babylon in human history. The first Babylon at the Tower of Babel, which, by the way, going to what uh, Pastor Hoagland was saying, uh, the Tower of Babel was an interdimensional stargate that allowed for the entrance of interdimensional beings into the Earth. How do you say that, Paul? It operated very much like CERN. I say that because when you translate the actual meaning of the word Babel or Babel or the Tower of Babylon, it literally means the gate of the gods or the gate of God, small g. What is a gate? It's an entranceway that allows for the entrance of interdimensional beings or fallen angels to come into the earth. This is guy who I won't mention and I really feel sorry for him because sometimes Francis Schaeffer the great theologian, was a personal mentor of mine when I was a baby in Christ. So my worldview was, was, was forged by the greatest evangelical theologian in the last 150 years. But tragically, there are, there are men and women in the body of Christ who uh, out of, I'm not, I'm not going to judge their heart, but they, they, any idea that they're uncomfortable with they will not behave like a true Christian leader and simply challenge a belief. That's okay. Iron sharpens iron. And speak as one filled with the Holy Spirit and controlled by the Holy Spirit and speak the truth in love. Because they've not allowed the Lord to develop their character, they will strike out, belittle, call names, lie, demonize, and marginalize other Christian leaders, which, which makes their, um, their criticism null and void because they expose themselves as people who, who are not truly qualified in the body of Christ to speak. You see, if, if, you, if you are criticizing and mounting a theological critique, that's fine because I, as a Bible teacher, have a responsibility to defend everything I say from Scripture. And if I can't defend it in Scripture, I have to change it. 
So if you speak the truth in love to me and you want to question me, I have a responsibility as a servant to give you the answers biblically. But we have some men and women who do not speak the truth in love. It's about ego and stuff. And so they forfeit their argument because they've not allowed the Holy Spirit to build character in them. You're waving something. Am I landing my bi bi biplane? Or am I one of the uh, Wright brothers? I don't know what this means. They do this in every country. What is this, hieroglyphics? Tim, tell me what he means. What? I'm all done? Do I have three minutes? Three. I apologize. I'll pick up the most important part of this in the next session. In contrast to the supernatural body of Christ, who is a pure virgin washed in the blood of Jesus, who is going to be married by the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's the mystery of the Apostle Paul speaking of Christ and the church, because the whole thing in Ephesians about the mystery of Christ and the church is the Apostle Paul saying, if you really want to know the deeper truths about Bible prophecy, you must understand and have a revelation of what God is trying to communicate to his people in the relationship of a husband and wife. It contains an enormous, powerful spiritual secret that, and that's the only way that you can get a full understanding of the relationship prophetically in terms of God's prophetic timeline, in terms of God's Bible prophecy of Christ in the church. Do you understand that? Now, and then I'm going to leave with this. The counterfeit to the supernatural body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is the whore, mystery Babylon, is the satanic Luciferian world system also coupled with an entire uh, century after century, thousands of years after thousands of years, beginning in ancient Babylon, the account of an occultic couple, uh, Nimrod and Semiramis. And Semiramis was a whore, a harlot. The harlot church is the church that is fornicating with the powers of Lucifer and the corrupt and evil world system, they fornicate with the harlot mystery Babylon. So the whore, the scarlet woman, mystery Babylon, also the Luciferian world system, and it's not an accident, the United Nations worships Gaia, female goddess of planet Earth, is at war. The, war, the counterfeit world system, which is the one world religion, one world government, and one world economic system of the false prophet, also known as Mystery Babylon the Whore, is waging war with Jesus Christ and the pure bride of Christ. So when we're reading about marriage with the Apostle Paul, we're reading about marriage, but we also need to see that that message has everything to do, it gives us the key to understanding who the body of Christ is, the bride of Christ is, in relationship to the counterfeit satanic system known as the whore, Mystery Babylon. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is pure. And the, when the body of Christ ceases being impure, she becomes the whore of Babylon. And I'll explain in the next meeting why and how. You can get more information at my website, paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us. And more speakers, please spread the word. We need to do an end run around the rigging of the...